Scuba diving is one of the most popular recreational sports today. In the United States alone, it has been estimated that there are three million scuba divers, with another 300,000 being certified each year. National and international diving organizations offer certification courses with an emphasis on safety. But with so many divers in the water, diving accidents do occur. Very few are life-threatening, but some may be characterized as major accidents. We are concerned here not with jellyfish stings or cuts and abrasions, but rather with decompression illnesses, accidents which involve the changes in pressure a diver undergoes when returning to the surface from the depths of a dive. Even a shallow dive may result in an injury. Duke University Medical Center is the home of the Divers Alert Network, or DAN. DAN was founded here in 1981 to assist in the treatment of underwater diving accidents. Dan's first priority is to help injured divers get treatment in an appropriate hyperbaric or recompression chamber if necessary. Dan's 24-hour emergency phone number is 919-684-8111. This number puts you in touch with Dan's diving medicine personnel who are ready to assist you with information about diving accidents and provide the names of diving medicine physicians in your area. After the hotline was created, Dan's mission soon expanded to include consultation, instruction, and the creation of educational materials such as this videotape, all aimed at improving diving safety awareness. Dr. Peter Bennett is the director of Dan. Scuba diving accidents have been reported throughout the United States and in many other countries across the world too. There are 500 to 600 accidents every year and some 60 to 100 fatalities in the United States. The accident may occur miles offshore in a popular scuba diving location, but scuba diving also takes place in lakes, quarries, rivers, and swimming pools all over the country and increasingly all around the world. Wherever there are divers, there is the potential for a dive accident. In fact, emergency medical personnel may encounter an injured diver hours away from the dive site. After the end of a dive, it may take many hours for symptoms to appear. These may be brought on by flying after diving or driving up a mountain or many other factors. At times, symptoms occur following vigorous exercise. And in some cases, divers will ignore or misinterpret initial symptoms but seek help later. This videotape is designed to familiarize EMTs and paramedics with the recognition and treatment of scuba diving accidents. Other emergency medical personnel will also find it instructive. We will outline the symptoms involved. We will also go over the mechanisms of injury related to scuba diving accidents and explain why 100% oxygen delivery is so essential. We will demonstrate how some divers are trained and equipped by Dan to provide appropriate 100% oxygen first aid. The initial treatment steps to be taken by emergency medical personnel will be discussed, including the immediate and continuous delivery of 100% oxygen. And we will consider issues related to the transportation and continued medical treatment of these patients. Treatment should include examination by a physician, and in most cases, recompression therapy in an appropriate hyperbaric chamber. It is important for all emergency medical personnel, even those who do not live near diving centers, to be able to recognize and manage diving accidents. Any hospital or medical facility may be called upon to treat a scuba diving accident. So every medical facility sponsoring an emergency medical service should establish a protocol for guidance in dealing with dive accidents at all levels of severity. Protocols should also be established for emergency department examination of injured divers, including consultation with Dan. And do remember to contact Dan whenever a diving accident is suspected. Through viewing this tape, you will learn more about the Divers Alert Network. It's important to contact Dan whenever you encounter a suspected diving accident. Again, the 24-hour emergency number to call is 919-684-8111. There is no charge for the service, and in an emergency, if necessary, you can even call Collect. <laughs> The term decompression illness actually encompasses two conditions, 
decompression sickness, or as divers refer to it, the bends, and arterial gas embolism, or as divers call it, air embolism. These conditions are serious, and both involve bubbles in the bloodstream and or tissues. The formation of bubbles in blood vessels results in an interruption of the blood supply and injury to the body. If blood supply to the brain is interrupted, permanent damage or death may occur very rapidly. Because the symptoms are similar for both conditions, because both can occur in the same patient, and because both require the same emergency treatment, some diving physicians refer to them under the combined label decompression illness. With any decompression illness, prompt recognition and appropriate treatment are very important. Recognition comes first. The most common symptoms are mild and are sometimes misunderstood by the diver and by healthcare professionals. They are unusual fatigue and sometimes skin itch. There are a variety of more serious symptoms. Pain may begin immediately, but it can occur later and the intensity may vary. Dizziness or true vertigo is another symptom. Although numbness and tingling may not seem to be serious, they do indicate that the nervous system is involved. Other symptoms may include skin rash, weakness, headache, extreme fatigue, vision disturbances, disorientation or confusion, personality changes such as irritability, seizures. Finally, if paralysis, unconsciousness, or stroke-like symptoms are involved, the injury is very serious. Let's take a look at the mechanisms related to dive accidents. Let's review why oxygen is so important to the human body and how it can help an injured diver. What are the mechanisms of injury of decompression illness? Dr. Richard Moon is a diving medicine expert and medical director for Dan. The cells of the body require a constant supply of oxygen. Oxygen is necessary for much of the metabolism that occurs within cells. Metabolism involves the chemical processes that convert nutrients or food into energy required by the cells. These processes use oxygen and produce carbon dioxide. In the absence of oxygen, the cells will deteriorate and die. Some cells are more sensitive than others to the deficiency of oxygen. Brain cells and nerve cells are particularly sensitive. Without oxygen, these cells will die within a matter of minutes. The respiratory system, of course, is primarily responsible for the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the body and the environment. Oxygen is taken from the atmosphere into the lungs, where it enters the bloodstream. Carbon dioxide is removed from the blood, taken into the lungs, and expelled into the atmosphere. Within the lungs, the exchange of gases, including oxygen and carbon dioxide, takes place between the alveoli and the capillaries. But oxygen and carbon dioxide are not the only gases exchanged. Nitrogen, the most abundant gas in the atmosphere, does not create problems at sea level. But underwater, as the pressure on the body increases, so does the impact of the nitrogen. The result can be decompression sickness, or the bends. Inert gases such as nitrogen play no part in metabolism. However, as long as we breathe air, a certain amount of nitrogen is dissolved in the tissues. At sea level, or one atmosphere, the air pressure amounts to approximately 15 pounds per square inch, or PSI. Of that, nitrogen exerts a partial pressure of about 80% of one atmosphere, or 12 PSI. Oxygen exerts a partial pressure of about 20% of one atmosphere, or 3 PSI. At a depth of 33 feet, or two atmospheres, the partial pressure doubles to approximately 24 psi for nitrogen and about 6 psi for oxygen. The increased pressure of the inert gas, nitrogen, means an increase in nitrogen absorbed into body tissues. It is this excess of nitrogen within the tissues that causes bubble formation when the diver surfaces. Again, the result can be what divers call the bends. With the bends more properly referred to as decompression sickness, the cause, then, is nitrogen bubble formation and growth. If the diver surfaces too quickly, the pressure will decrease so rapidly that the body cannot get rid of the excess nitrogen. Bubbles will form as the nitrogen dissolved in body tissues comes out of solution. 
Other than the bends, the other major decompression illness is arterial gas embolism, or as divers call it, air embolism. Air embolism affecting the brain results from air bubbles entering the arterial blood stream from a lung subjected to overpressure. The overpressure is usually caused by the diver's failure to breathe normally while surfacing, or by air trapped in the lung as a result of an illness or a chronic medical condition. Bubbles pass through the arteries to the brain where they affect the blood supply, much like a stroke. As the brain is affected by a lack of oxygen, the diver may lose consciousness, have a seizure, or show other signs of major injury, up to and including death. Since the treatment is the same for both conditions, there is no need to distinguish between them. The important thing is to recognize the symptoms of a pressure-related dive accident and know what to do when you encounter one. And one of the most important first aid measures is the administration of 100 percent oxygen. When a pressure-related diving accident occurs, the use of 100 percent oxygen in first aid treatment helps to reduce bubble size by removing nitrogen from body tissues. As nitrogen is washed out of the tissues, the tissues can reabsorb gases from the bubbles. A pressure gradient from the bubbles to the tissues is created so that the bubbles may become smaller or even disappear, allowing circulation to improve. In the case of hypoxia due to near drowning or other conditions, the use of oxygen will help the victim by increasing the oxygenation of the blood. I don't feel quite right. I think something's wrong. Okay, why don't we get out of the water? When an accident does occur, taking the right steps at the right time can save a life or prevent a lifetime disability. Why don't you go get some help? Dan advises divers to get professional medical care as quickly as possible. While help is on the way, though, first aid treatment should begin. Since many dive sites are in remote areas or some distance offshore, it's important for divers themselves to know what to do. One Divers Alert Network goal is to instruct all divers in the first aid treatment of dive accidents, including oxygen first aid with the special oxygen unit designed for divers to use in emergencies. Dan Orr is the training director for the Divers Alert Network. The Dan oxygen unit contains a Luxford Jumbo D aluminum cylinder, a Life Support Products multifunction regulator, and a life support products demand inhaler valve with clear true fit mask. The Hudson Model 1060 non rebreather mask and the layered all pocket mask with supplemental oxygen inlet are also included, along with the latest edition of the Dan Underwater Diving Accent Manual. The unit does not contain a nasal cannula or simple face mask, as these do not provide the high concentration of inspired oxygen that is necessary for diving emergencies. Also note the demand inhaler valve has no button and therefore is not a demand valve resuscitator. The Dan Underwater Diving Accident Manual provided with the unit offers guidance to those assisting injured divers. There's a place in the manual for the divers to record information about the dive history, symptoms, and first aid treatment the injured diver receives prior to your arrival on the scene. It's important to note that the manual also contains directions for a simple neurological examination, which the divers may have performed. The results of such an exam and any other details which may have been entered in the manual will assist emergency medical personnel and physicians and will provide vital information on the patient's condition. The manual also offers guidance in the use of the DAN oxygen unit, Let's take a look at how this unit can be used to deliver 100% oxygen as a first aid measure. The patient who is able to breathe unassisted is the most common type of injured diver, and those are the easiest to treat with oxygen. The DAN unit, properly prepared, is ready for the immediate delivery of 100% oxygen using the demand inhaler valve. It is imperative that the injured diver receive the highest possible concentration of inspired oxygen. Prior to your arrival on the scene, the injured diver may be told that breathing oxygen may make them feel better and that it's not painful or harmful. This is oxygen. It will make you feel better. Can I help you? Yes. The mask is placed over the mouth and nose and the injured diver is told to breathe normally just as they would with a scuba regulator. The injured diver who is alert may be encouraged to hold the mask to maintain a good seal. This will provide further reassurance 
making the injured diver feel a sense of control. If the injured diver is breathing and won't tolerate the demand inhalator valve, the non-rebreather mask can be used instead. Dan and the diving medical community recommend a minimum constant flow setting for injured divers of 15 liters per minute. As you know, the flow must be sufficient to keep the reservoir bag inflated and provide the highest possible concentration of inspired oxygen. It's important to remember that when you arrive on the scene, the divers may have some training in the treatment of decompression illness and may have begun appropriate first aid, including the administration of 100% oxygen. But you never know what you will find at the scene of a dive accident. Many divers don't have oxygen, don't have the manual, don't know what to do, and some don't even recognize the symptoms of decompression illnesses. Some divers foolishly re-enter the water in an attempt to recompress after symptoms have appeared, and some have paid the price for that mistake. You may be the first to provide appropriate treatment. <laughs> Once you arrive on the scene, assessment of the ABCs comes first. A for airway, B for breathing, and C for circulation. If the diver is not breathing or is pulseless, then of course CPR and advanced life support, or ALS, take priority. If, on the other hand, primary assessment indicates no problems, the next steps can begin. Let's review the symptoms. The serious symptoms we covered include pain, dizziness, or true vertigo, numbness, tingling, skin rash, weakness, headache, extreme fatigue, vision disturbances, disorientation or confusion, personality changes, seizure, paralysis, and unconsciousness or stroke-like symptoms. With mild symptoms such as unusual fatigue and itching, the treatment is the same as that described for serious symptoms. Jeff Birch is an advanced diver medic and a training specialist for the Divers Alert Network. When the symptoms of a pressure-related diving accident are present, immediate action must be taken. Remember, begin by assessing the ABCs and administer CPR if required and follow ALS protocol. Deliver or continue delivery of 100% oxygen with a clear, tight-fitting mask. Even if the divers have already done an abbreviated neurological exam, as recommended by Dan, you should reevaluate vital signs and conduct a neurological exam at the scene. Assessment should continue periodically during transport to a medical facility because a patient's condition can change suddenly and dramatically. The diver's wetsuit or exposure suit should be removed and the diver should be kept dry and protected from the wind and from exposure to fumes. Evaporation, even on a warm day, will cause a wet diver to lose a lot of body heat unless protected. Provide insulation under the diver, especially if the environment is cool or cold. Place the patient in a supine or left lateral recumbent position. Continue to administer oxygen with a tight-fitting clear mask at the highest possible oxygen concentration. A convulsion or seizure may occur as a result of the dive injury or from hypoxia in the near drowning victim. Remember, if a seizure does occur, don't forcefully restrain the injured diver, but do ensure protection from injury, particularly to the patient's head. The seizure will usually stop within minutes and after the ABCs are re-evaluated, resume 100% oxygen administration. Most divers are at least mildly dehydrated due to the effects of breathing totally dry air and because of fluid loss in association with immersion and exercise. The alert and oriented diver may have been given non-alcoholic liquids such as water, fruit juice, or caffeine-free drinks. This is beneficial as dehydration may increase the risk of decompression sickness and injured divers frequently experience long delays before medical help is available. You may be instructed by protocol to begin IV fluids. This fluid should be intravenous saline, 5% dextrose and saline, or similar fluids. Dextrose 5% in water, also known as D5W, should not be used because it would lead to physical imbalance.
due to problems with osmolality. The use of 100% oxygen in the early stages of a dive accident may reduce or totally relieve the symptoms within a short time. Even if the symptoms do disappear, 100% oxygen therapy must be continued and don't assume that the emergency is over. Symptoms could reappear if oxygen were discontinued and the injured diver must be transported to the nearest medical facility and a diving physician consulted. Don't forget to take a DAN manual with you. If the divers have done their job, it will contain information about the initial condition and first aid treatment of the injured diver. It also contains information which you and other medical professionals will find useful, including Dan's 24-hour emergency number. Don't forget to contact Dan. Remember that the onset of symptoms may be delayed by several hours and that symptoms may be brought on by pressure changes aboard aircraft or during mountain driving. If possible, the injured diver's diving partner or buddy should accompany you to the emergency department or meet you there. The buddy may have important information about the patient's dive profile and decompression status. The diver should be transported to the nearest hospital emergency department for evaluation and stabilization. If air evacuation is involved, it is important to minimize pressure changes because reduced pressure at altitude can cause more nitrogen bubbles to form in the body and cause existing bubbles to increase in size. In helicopters, we try to maintain the lowest safe altitude, preferably between 500 and 1,000 feet above the ground. In pressurized aircraft, normally a normal sea level cabin pressure is maintained. Whether by air, sea, or by land, once the patient arrives at the emergency department or clinic, remember to provide the DAN manual and the information it contains. The emergency department physician should contact DAN for consultation about appropriate treatment and for assistance in locating a suitable recompression chamber if needed. The diver should not be transported to a recompression facility until contact with the chamber has been made and the diver accepted for treatment. Few divers realize that most hyperbaric treatment facilities are not available 24 hours a day, and some are not even appropriate for treating diving accidents. So before you go to any chamber, you should contact Dan first. This will allow time to assemble the staff, to prepare the hyperbaric chambers, and to make advanced treatment decisions. Don't forget, call Dan first. Having viewed this videotape, you should better understand how to recognize and treat a scuba diving accident. We have outlined the symptoms involved. The mechanisms of injury related to scuba diving accidents were discussed and the importance of 100% oxygen delivery explained. We demonstrated how some divers are trained and equipped by Dan to provide appropriate 100% oxygen first aid. The initial treatment steps to be taken on the scene were described including the immediate and continuous delivery of 100% oxygen. Issues related to the transportation and continued medical treatment of these patients by a physician were also covered, including issues related to contacting a recompression chamber. Finally, through viewing this tape, you have become better acquainted with the Divers Alert Network. Anytime you encounter a diving emergency, please remember to call Dan's hotline. If necessary, call Collect. This 24-hour number connects you with the switchboard at Duke University Medical Center. Tell the operator that you have a diving emergency. The operator will either connect you with Dan directly or will have someone call you back. The consultation is free of charge.
Thank you.